Welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. That's a better picture of me than I look in person, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave that up. Okay, sounds good. You're just afraid I'm going to turn it into like a social media post or something. Well, I look like uh, a little worse off than some of the people I've seen on the streets in Santa Fe. So Mm -hmm. there um, you go. Look at my moving blanket city. You know, I had to put cloths over all the mirrors because not moving (laughs) over the holidays and recovering is not a pretty sight, I tell you. (laughs) Are you you telling me there's more? There's just more Doug to love for the new year. My belly is going to need to get a uh, whole new zip code if I keep this up. Okay. Apparently, you don't need as many calories sitting around doing nothing than when you're like ah. going glass and going to shows and all that good stuff. Very true. I noticed that myself. <laughs> Happy New Year, Douglas. Nice to see you on here. It's been a few weeks. It has been a minute, hasn't it? It has. How are you, how are you doing? Um, I'm fine. You know, uh, the same, to be mm-hmm. honest. Just um, I feel like I, I burn the candle at, at both ends most of the time, just kind of balancing trying to make work and and raise kids and mm-hmm. be a husband that's the that's the the routine right yeah well over the holidays do you kind of take a break from the studio and just do everything that the holidays entail or do you kind of try and fit in studio days how does that work for you you know i after one of a kind i typically will have like a a you know a custom piece or two that, uh, that i'm trying to get done for the holidays but i did not do that uh, my folks came in right after one of a kind oh yeah and so we had christmas here with them that was great we geared up got the house all decorated and and had it had decorated a little bit early cuz they still wanted to have their holidays at home with my my sister and and the rest of the folks back on on the east coast sure. by the time it was over though i don't know if you've run into this with multiple holiday yeah. situations uh-huh. When they left, I was like, okay, I'm done. Completely done. I'm like, I don't want to shop anymore. I don't want to wrap anymore. I don't want right. to undecorate the tree. And it's like December 12th. The kids aren't even out of school. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So. You've got to get yourself mentally ready to gear up for multiple I did, rounds. I think I was a turd. I think I was a turd for like a month. I just was like, I it was done with it. And I'm like, I don't know. I, you know me. You've <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in a good Burton mood. is finest, I am hearing. I'm not hiding it. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm not hiding it. That's it's it just is what it is. So I tried to gear up. Plus my kids are like Santa doesn't exist anymore. Um, hey, hey, you might be doing some spoilers here on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Spoiler alert. Santa's me. Uh, actually, Santa is Steve Harmston. That's that's who it is. Uh, sorry. Spoilers indeed. So um, my kids are like, they wanted clothes. So boring. Eh, eh, boring. Wait till they they're 21 and 25. They want money. Oh, yeah. You do right. is hand them some cash and we're oh, done. Oh, they want money now, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I don't know. It was boring. I mean, we had an amazing Christmas. My wife was incredibly generous and held it all together. And we had an incredible trip after our Christmas with my parents. Mm-hmm. And then we did ours here with the kids. And then we went up to Minnesota and did it with our big extended family, who I just adore. Yeah. But it was a lot. You know? Yeah. It's not easy. How about you? Good. Good. I mean, with what I'm dealing with, everything's low key. And so that was wonderful just to have everything low key. But one thing that I wanted to bring up that a lot of us artists deal with is when we get together with our kind of normie extended families and we're the, Mm. you know, we're kind of the kooky artist in the bunch. You ever, I mean, where, how do you fall in that group? Oh, uh, I don't know. I think I'm, um, yeah, keep going. Let's let's see where you're going with this, and I'll, well, I'll, I'll add on. I love my family, and I love. I'm not. I'm not trying to. You know, everyone's been super accepting, they're, but they're a huge pain in the ass. But, but they let's give you honest. so much advice. They give you so much Ooh. normie advice. When, oh, for God. example, what am I, what am I going through right now? I'm going through this physical condition, and I'm hearing. You know, well, hey, have you ever considered? And when they started to say that, my you know hair spikes on the back of my neck, and I think, oh, Will would be ready to come out fighting when he hear that one. Yeah. And the advice was, have I ever considered getting an employee who would blow the glass for me? Mm. Okay. And so you know, I I did just what you did there. I gave the okay. Mm, like I'll I'll on yeah. the surface I'll entertain this I this really sure. great idea they have to make my life easier. But then as I start to explain, well, the nature of our business is it's all about handmade, one-of-a-kind work made by the artists themselves, blah, blah, blah. Sure. Well, then they get all defensive as if I'm like, 
I'm somehow shooting down their brilliant idea, and why wouldn't I ever <laughs> consider that? How, how could you not consider that? Yeah. You know, why don't you just get somebody to do the shows for you, Douglas? Well, why don't you just hire somebody younger well, so that they could make it, and they could go do the show, and then just give you the money? And then right? just well, that was the end part of this whole story. Was at some point when they become professionals and they're making a boatload of money, they will just write me retirement checks oh, for my right. training, my ideas, my mentoring. You know, every now and then it'll come on board where like somebody will, will be talking online and be like, have you ever considered selling your business? And I just don't think that that's a, a thing. I don't think that exists. For, for us anyway. Not doing what we do. Yeah. Well, it's uh, that's interesting. I, you know, I, you said, well, do you ever get any advice? I'm like, well, no, I don't. <laughs> and then you thought of one. <laughs> well, no, I just, I've established the fact that I don't take it well. And I found a, I was having a conversation with my wife and she was like, oh, well, I've already told my family not to give you advice. <laughs> she's, she's like, like the, she's like warned everybody that that is well, yeah, the trigger that's reaction. Not, he doesn't is gonna, like that. No. That's not going to be good. Don't give him advice. Don't talk to him They're about it. Like, sheesh, it goes back what's to his problem. <laughs> <laughs> you don't make small talk with a volatile stranger, right? Exactly right. Well, I was the volatile stranger in that uh, in that conversation, and it actually made me think of my talk with Duke Kloss. And I don't know if the listeners remember this part, where he says that the trouble with some artists and, and Duke has a long career on the road, as as we all know, he's been doing He's this seen since, everything. Yeah, the beginning. Anyway, he said the, what he's observed over the years is the tragic flaw with some artists who do art shows is that they don't know when to stop succeeding and that people don't know when to put boundaries around that moment of like, once you expand to needing a boatload of employees or whatever, your business model then turns into being a boss. And it, it kind of steps away from the creative aspect of it. Now, I'm not saying that mm -hmm. all black and white for everyone who wants to be a self-employed artist out there. But it is a good point of kind of staying at the right size to fit what your goals and intentions are. Yeah, I, that's interesting. You know, I mean, there are people out there that have assistants. You know, when I lived in Richmond, I had somebody, I, I called her my assistant. She did made all of my panels. She did all of my shipping. She did all of my, mm -hmm. uh, bagged all of my prints mm -hmm. too. So, um, you know, I, there are some people out there who be like, oh, my God, he's not doing everything. And it's like, well, fuck off. That's <laughs> I definitely I, agree. I, there are elements they're clearing of the plate for you. Like if you're if you pay somebody to sweep your studio out so you don't have to do it at the end of the day so that you can actually make more work. Yeah. Then, more power to you. I'm not against any of that. And I the thing that I learned this year that I loved was how can we I can't afford it yet, but how can we go to the level where you can actually have a relationship with with someone who can drive your work cross country and all you do is fly in and do the mm. shows. I mean, that is a huge waste as some of those travel times and the wear and tear on our bodies with sitting in a van for four days. Yeah, it would be an interesting show to just like have this conversation that you and I are having and then cut back to some of the things like the Duke Lawson said, just punch that in. More editing for you, Douglas. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> my, my yeah, pleasure. sure. It's a great idea. <laughs> Oh, it's just make it happen. As evidenced uh, by this quote from Duke Lawson. <laughs> that's right. I'm an idea man. No, but like that does go back to like what uh, Dolan and Allie Marie were talking about. Allie Marie is, is, is so on it. She's as much a part of the business as he is, if not more. And she's not wasting her time sitting in a van. Nope. You know, she's flying home and, and taking care of, of leads and, and um, closing that. deals, yeah. swinging deals and eating meals. Hey, it's all within the norm. Speaking of the Guymans. I noticed online and I messaged Dolan about this and he gave me permission to talk about it. They're doing a really cool thing. They're kind of giving back to young artists. They want to help an emerging artist out there by offering yeah. a grant. And I don't know all the details. So anyone out there who might be new in the business, want to get a little assistance with mentoring towards the business side of your artwork, go on Dolan Guyman's page. On his Instagram. That's where I saw it. Yeah. Uh, if you go on to his website or his Instagram, but I, I, I really, I was going to mention that myself, so I'm glad you brought that up. But cool. I, I just am really impressed with those guys and how they are yeah. giving back and, and doing the grant. And knowing those guys, I, I can't imagine that it's just going to be a check. It's going to be some advice too. Some and, mentoring and talk type about thing. And yeah, incredible. for sure. Yeah. 
So check that out. Get the details. But I'll drop all that in the the episode notes. So when you're listening to the podcast, just look at the description and there'll be a a link to their page for that. Yeah, that's just Dolan Guyman at Dolan Guyman. That's D-O-L-A-N-G-E-I-M-A-N on Instagram. You can find all the details and all the links and and all of that good stuff. So um, even if you're just interested in looking at it, it's, it's something cool to see. Yeah. And I mean, it might be good for any of us out there who feel like we are in a place where we can give back. That is a good way to give back. That might be a good example for our an initiative for other art practices to, to do the same thing. <laughs> You're going to go the other way and be like, and uh, I'm going to apply I'm because I, as well. <laughs> I, have, I really need some parental guidance and I need some. I'm wondering if Dolan and Allie Marie will adopt me at this point. I promise I'll clean my plate. I'll clean up my room. Uh, I'm a good Good sign. Well, speak. So okay, so this will be the this will be the plug section of the podcast. I actually have done something like that. You got hair plugs? Shut the f up, man. <laughs> <laughs> I need them. It's a lost cause right, right, right now. I tell right. you, no. razor is the way to go. No, mm. um, I decided over this break that I, you know, was going to focus on business and focus on the, you know, innovation side of. Since I have the time to do nothing but think and learn. And so I joined Kat Tesla and Julie Schumer's Business of Art workshops. Oh, cool. And I want to send out a plug for that. If anyone is looking for a little bit of business side help with marketing, with just all around aspects of running a business, they talk about working with galleries and working with shows and working on social media. So I'll also drop the link for them on our episode notes and you can check that out. Yeah, please do. That's exciting. There are a lot of our guests now that are kind of giving back. Yeah. Marjolin Vandahart's got a wonderful program as well as Kat Tesla and now Dolan and Ali Marie. It's it's some exciting stuff happening. So inspiration yeah. as far as uh, the new year goes and, and what we could do to give back, especially during, during these trying times. Oh, hey, well, speaking of trying times, you know, we're entering a new year where we're looking mm. at all the gloom and doom talk of economy and stuff. Are you doing anything different with that talk? Or are you going to just proceed as normal? I just proceed as normal. I hate all this chicken little bullshit. It's all oh, the sky is falling. I've, we've been through it before. We have. And might as well deal with it when it's face face front is how I yeah, feel. Yeah, face front. It. I mean, OK, here is something I I I, I am. And this is our fellow artists are going to hate hearing this, sure. but I I got more shows on the docket Yay. than I did last year. Okay. It was all going to be smaller and 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 bigger punch, and now I'm just booking everything I can. You got I'll the hamster wheel needed. lined up for you, do you? Yeah, yeah, I do. I've got a I got a probably, gosh, six eight of them on the books, and I think I only did six last year. Okay. Well, I was looking ahead to this year too, with the with the kind of planning in mind, thinking about. Last year was half of what I would typically do, and I think I found the sweet spot. I'm pretty happy with right around 12, 12, 13. Okay. And I'm going to go forward with with that. But what is different is I started sooner in the year last year, so I'm going to kind of have to mm. you know, slide my calendar year more like April to November as opposed to what I did earlier in, this, in the year this year. Yeah, it's going to be a, a tricky year. I, I'm booking a lot of the same shows that my uh, ex is doing, oh. so we're going to have to juggle the kids somehow. Yeah, you know, yeah. so she's going to be at the same shows, which is great. But yeah, who raises the children? They, but they're at a sweet spot too. It'll be a little challenging for them. They've got grandparents and aunties. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. So I don't have know. Have they been? Have the aunties been asked yet? <laughs> You're broaching uh, that. <laughs> well, they don't listen to the shows. So fuck them. <laughs> Uh, no, don't fuck the aunties. Uh, the, uh, the, pro- you know, no, nothing's really been lined up. Yeah. But, um, no, you know, I remember those days and I'm thinking back on, you know, being a parent and, and being in this business, it is a little bit like, and forgive the reference. I've been watching a lot of movies, but it's, a, it feels to me like being in an episode of everything, everywhere, all at once, you know, it's like, you're no. standing, you don't know, do you know that show? Do you know <laughs> no, that movie? I don't know that one. I don't know. It, it no. is insane. It's like. It's Michelle Yao and Jamie oh, Lee okay. Curtis, and it's like she'll be standing in one space having a reality, and then boom, something else changes, and you've got these these people coming and trying to kill you. And it's basically – sometimes this business can be like that. It's like I, I, when I'm watching the movie, I'm like, yep, that's like that's like being a roadshow artist right there. Huh. Interesting. I'll check it out. 
Yeah, it was really good. But anyway, so uh, yeah. and so you're you're spending your you're biding your time in your little prison cell uh, watching a lot of Netflix, oh, a lot god. of Amazon. Oh my god! If uh, if this uh, artist podcast doesn't work out well, or if I sit on my ass too much longer, it's gonna we're gonna be having to shift gears into like a Rotten Tomatoes uh, review uh, podcast. Okay, <laughs> you know that'd be I've thought about that with like uh, it's it's the independent artist podcast book club um, <laughs> book of the month, and we've already talked about that David Byrne thing a number of different times. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so when we were with Ben last episode, we kind of stumbled into the conversation about how sometimes art is created with a venue in mind, be it music yeah. or be like we create something like as an installation or whatever. And that sometimes unconsciously or subconsciously that can kind of float into the creating of it, even though we think we're coming at it from a totally clean slate. Right. Yeah, you're coming into it with your own inspirations, but really you're you're thinking about um and this is where it made sense to me and we're talking about David Burns how music works and it's it's really just a, a a small passage in the first couple of chapters or something where he's talking about creating music for and I'm just retouching on this before I get into how it means something to me but yeah. you know it's like you're you're creating these uh songs to be played in a punk rock club and it's like okay, well I'm creating my work to be seen on the street. And it's like it it definitely is going into these high dollar homes, right. but it's being seen on the street. And the thing that got me, I went up to see family in Minneapolis and one of my very favorite museums in the country is the Walker, which sure. I'm sure you've been to. Oh, yeah. Living up there and going through the Walker and, and walking around and, and checking out the different paintings and installations. And what I noticed about all the pieces is – I work fairly large. You've seen my booth. Mm -hmm. I've got these six foot by four foot paintings are, are kind of my norm. Mm -hmm. I'd love to work a little bit larger. They're getting heavy. But the interesting thing to me is like a good portion of them are much bigger even than I'm showing mm -hmm. uh, in my booth mm -hmm. because I'm constrained by that booth size, sure. you know, that 10 by 10 and my little – my pro panels and my walls. And also I've noticed too is like as – art show artists, we're trying to get people's attention because I've measured this before mm -hmm. about a stride, you know? Right. It's it's two and a half strides. A 10 by 10 is two and a half strides. And if you're not getting somebody's attention in that, or if your kid drops his milkshake, or somebody says, look over here, or there's somebody in your way, it, it disrupts that two and a half strides. So you're trying, you're like, look at me. So my work has very little negative space. And I love the negative space in the installation pieces that you see at the Walker. Yeah. And I love that. And and it's almost like Prince used to say, and I've, I've heard so many different musicians talk about Prince said, the funk is not in the notes. It's in the space between the notes. Tom Petty said the same thing. It's like, it's the dynamics of the song is the space in between it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to get at going into the new year how do i have more negative space within my work so that my you mean within like the of displaying breathe? of the work or within the work I don't itself know. yeah the display i mean dolan mentioned this too and, and it was a throwaway line mm -hmm. where he said he vowed one year never to have a, a painting on top of a painting mm -hmm. like never stack it like let that let that piece breathe so it has room around sure. it so that you can actually enjoy it and then how do you do that within that 10 by 10? Sure. How do you show that? You know, yeah. how do you give your pieces breathing room? And, and you know, you've got like very successful business models like take NAIA board member Diane French. Uh -huh. You know, her booth uh, looks great, always looks great, has a super old school way of showing. She's got stacks of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like everything is shown all the time. Right. You know, and I think that that is – a totally viable business model, but I'm just looking at how do I give my characters within my paintings breathing room mm -hmm. and also still be seen yeah. at a show? For me anyway, if I have one thing, I want to have it represented in maybe a couple different colors or styles mm -hmm. because it's like that you have that one shot and you always get the well, do you have that like anything else? And mm -hmm. you can have it in the back or whatever, but it's like – it's kind of like – it takes me back to our talk with Eric Lee on the first season of the yeah. pod where, I mean, he showed up 
with a freaking couch and coffee tables and oh, I love that and put out like flowers to give the ambiance of what his work will look like at home. I mean, the downside right. is we have to actually travel with all that stuff to create that. that yeah, space. Oh, it was a huge trailer and it takes you all the time to set up a living space right. and, and all of that. But um, he didn't do it forever, no. but it definitely worked for him. It's for like, a how long do you make time. that leap, though, so that you can create that that negative space that it gets its proper focal point? You know, people need to yeah. be able to come by and be like, whoa. But if there's so much going on around it, if it's too busy, there's too much for the eyes to bop around at and the the star doesn't get its focal point. Right. It's really interesting to see different people's, I don't know, their business models. There was a guy I was next to at Cherry Creek where he closed his booth if he had a big client, had a big fish. Oh, yeah. Put a, yeah I remember this chain story. Yeah, let's... yeah. He put a chain up. I'm like, that's ballsy. Or he needed a breather and was like, I'll be open in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And he goes and he's dusting his work and he's inside and people are walking by and we're like, who's this asshole? Like, this is amazing. But this element of you can't come in now that, but if the, <laughs> if the, if the you know what I mean? If the audience wants yeah. to come in, it's almost like what I can't, I can't, oh, oh I've got to come back and I've got to come back. What's going yeah. on in there? It really, it really piques the interest when you have to kind of put the brakes on somebody. Right. <laughs> I mean, we are all like. We put the taps on our toes and, and we're all like, oh, hello, it's me. And, and you try to do your thing. I love that that different version where you, you step back. Playing coy. <laughs> yeah. Play coy or you play in demand. You know, you you like you create that kind of feeding frenzy and people are kind of like looking up and, hey, can I come in? And we're like, yeah, give me five minutes. I'll be I'll be right with you. Wow. You run the risk. That, of I mean, even you off. describing that makes me a little nervous. I, I am prone to being the. What 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 can I do for you? What what do you need? What do you need? Oh, can I oh, do yeah. this? Can I do that? <laughs> you, know? you guys do. You guys are very. You and Renee are are very um, attentive, accommodating with folks that that come in. And you, there's a lot of this and that and this and that with with your different color styles. And you know what? Though you, you reach can... a point with that, and like even with like deal making, where if they've spent enough time with you and they see that you've kind of run through the ringer with them a bit. We often get apologies, like, I'm sorry I'm doing this to you. I'm sorry. We're, and we're like, this is what we do. This is We want to show you what we make, yeah. you know? But then they do kind of cross a threshold where the sale is inevitable. It's just finding the right thing. And it right. will happen. And if it isn't at the show, it can turn into something that gets ordered or commissioned or something like that. I think that that eagerness does get rewarded at some point in that Connection. I agree. I agree. And it, it, that reminds me of another thing. And this, this goes into sales. But mm -hmm. when they say, I'm sorry, I'm doing this to you. Yeah. I know I've got them. Yes. I'm like, oof. And that's where I close it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry you're doing it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, baby, you're all mine. Like <laughs> Ben Fry, we didn't get him to say this when he was on the phone, on the, on the podcast yeah. with us. But when I've talked to him about sales, he, he says this all the time. He's like, they are amateur art buyers and we are professional art sellers. Yep. And so that's kind of like, that's my move though. Like when they're like, oh, I'm so sorry that I'm doing this to you. And you're like, oh my gosh, are you kidding? This is, like you said, this is what I do. And then they start asking like, well, how would I even get it home? And you're like, look, you just bought a really nice painting and they haven't even given me their credit card. Right. And they start referring to the pieces. Oh, I see. So I'm that's like, even like jumping hey, the gun a bit, but it Oh, it yeah. Pushes them I over. start referring to it as their piece. I'm yeah. like, well, your piece is so and so. And I'm like, look, you just bought a nice painting. Don't worry about getting it home. That's my job. You know, how's it going to fit in your car? It doesn't. It fits in my truck. Right. I'll be. That's great. And they're like, oh, well, oh, you know, and they start feeling special. And, and it's all about making them feel special and being liked. Well, here's a new technique I've never tried. But again, what I've been watching on, on the old boob tube, I watched the Bernie Madoff documentary, like four or five mm. part series. And yeah. he, I think it was an interview they had with him or something where he actually talked about how he could convince all of his investors to stay with him was when he would ever be questioned. So like, you know, they might say to him, you know, um, can, can you show me how much I'm making here? I'm getting a little nervous. I think I might sell. That his reaction to them was to get angry and indignant and be like, you want to cash out? Fine. You cash out. I'm going to give it to you, but never come back again. And he like insults them and says like, they're Ooh. not worthy to yeah. be part of his investment group. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no worries. I, 
I, I, I'll stay with you. No, I don't want to cash out now. And that's how he fought. <laughs> that's how he kept that Ponzi scheme I don't know that we going. should be getting. Yeah, I mean, it is a he's a that's a manipulation technique for sure. And it's like, are we are we really looking to give the folks some some business advice from Bernie? Madoff? I'm not advocating it, but I've seen a few <laughs> people on the road who don't use honey. They use vinegar to get their way. And it works for them. I'm just saying it works for some of them. Yeah, that's funny. I can think of one who's who's really salty with his his people. Pushes the and, pushes and the line a little well. bit, definitely, but yeah. it doesn't oh, ever yeah. bite him. It doesn't seem to bite him in the butt on it. So it works. no, and I the same guy uh, does the same thing with shows too, and he always seems to get in. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right, be like Bernie Madoff, I guess. <laughs> no, <laughs> no don't, don't be like Bernie. Don't Madoff. be like Bernie. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> but I will that's say right. that. You know, listening to the people who were victims of his crimes, I mean, it's like it was part of our whole uh, customer base down in like West Palm Beach and Florida and all down in there. It was. It just literally feels like the people we talk to every single weekend walking into our booths in, in Florida, South Florida. That he sounded like those guys? No, that the customers who were t- who were taken by by Bernie um, oh, are, yeah. is our same clients. Oh, yeah. The Boca Raton area sure. and all of that, that east coast of Florida, southeast yep. Florida, for sure. Yeah, they. I remember that. I remember they really got hit. And um, that's that's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a smaller world than you think, isn't it? It is, yeah. Hey, back to the kind of the whole New Year's idea. One of the things mm. we, we did in Cats and Julie's as a kind of an assignment was kind of a year review. And I'm wondering, do you ever do anything like that? Do you kind of look back over last year and and see how it shapes your goals for the new year and what you want to do differently? No. No? <laughs> I don't. I just, I want more. I just do. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, it's funny. Like, what I think about this this industry, we're so, I do, actually. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. Yeah. But, uh, what I find is that unlike a lot of other industries, I remember being, you know, when I had a job and January 1st would roll around and people would be like, oh, it's a new year. And he'd be like, no, it's not. We're just doing just the, the continuation. Same thing we're always doing. Yeah. And it's it's like, well, with us, uh, it really is a new year. You know, it's a new schedule. You're moving things in. You're trying new markets. Mm-hmm. Um, I do find that some markets get stale. Sometimes a show doesn't work out with your schedule, yeah. if you know what I mean. <laughs> that's uh, that's our line. When customers hear us say it didn't work out in our schedule, it means we got the goose egg on that jury result. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, please F off again. So, yeah, it, you never know. I mean, you never really know what, what show you're going to gonna do or – if a big one doesn't work out with your schedule right. and you you have to, you know, you can't go there, then how many shows does it take to make that one up? Sure. You know? Yeah. Does it does it take two to three more to to make up for that that um big daddy, yeah. whatever <laughs> yeah. Colossus calls yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, the super shows. <laughs> one of the, the super, super shows. Show. Oh. I think about our year coming up and there are a lot of new players or new puzzle pieces coming in that aren't completely brand new. It's like you know how every year you say we we can craft together a good season, and that's ultimately our goal. And right. I feel like some of them aren't the same puzzle pieces that I did last year. And my first reaction is fear. But then it's like, you know what? I rarely go back to a show that I've done, let's say, four times. And it does not repeat its success rate. But I can have a similar success rate. And maybe even the same success rate, if you look at the bottom line, when I swap in these other puzzle pieces and keep the collectors feeling like, I don't know if I'm going to see him next year. This is the year Mm. I need to jump. And so I am feeling optimistic and hopeful about some new opportunities that I have coming on in the the next year. Okay. When do you think you're going to be back out there on the road? I just phoned in a cancellation for our first show Mm. because... I got my boot on yesterday. Uh, people might be okay. interested to know about that. Yeah, I had thought that when I got the boot on that it might take me a day or two and then I'll just be walking around on this on this boot. But man, was I ever surprised at just even standing on two feet and putting the lightest amount of weight on this foot, how bad it hurts and how I'm not oh. ready. And the doctor said, Oh, no, 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 you won't be, you won't be walking around for about three more weeks and absolutely no studio for at least three to five weeks. So okay. that changed our plans for, for what our season's going to be. So 
like I said earlier, it's going to start later in the year and hopefully go into later, you know, further out in the year. Okay. Does that, does that have you looking at uh, further down the line schedule, like September, October True. or more when typically we, we hang it up? Uh, um, uh, not necessarily that's when I'm starting, but I will extend now into extend into, into those months right. where I might have – because I'm going to have to do this again only with with my left side. And who knows? Maybe if, if things go well and I can make it through 2023, then I might put it this foot off to 2024. But okay. it's all like moving puzzle pieces. You're going to be so prosperous looking. Prosperous. You're going to be so prosperous. That's what I call when I put I'm going to be some, looking robust. I, yeah, <laughs> when I when I put on a couple of LBs and they were like, oh, man, I'm look at my prosperity. My prosperity is showing. Okay, well, aside from the whole New Year's resolutions with our – business and our artwork. My New Year's resolution was to hop on the spin bike starting next week, since I don't have to stand on this foot, and start mm-hmm. actually training so I can be on the, on my road bike this summer. But I won't be able to do that now for another month and a half. So that was something that kind of bummed me out too yesterday. It's uh, I'm kind of stuck in limbo for a while, but I'll be, I'll be fine. Major League Baseball star- season starts in two weeks. <laughs> baseball season. Spring training, baby. No baseball playing for me. My dad was the baseball player. Were you a baseball player, by the way? Uh, not, not much. I played some, but uh, really just a, I'm just a fan. I, I knew so you were a huge fan. I was it. wondering if it came from playing as a youth, but my dad was the baseball player in our family. And so, of course, I was put into into baseball as a youngster. And let's just say that I was a really good scorekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you fill the box? In? Oh, damn. I don't know anyone else out there who's more artistically inclined and less athletically inclined. But, you know, you get to the end of the season and, and they, they put pressure on these kids who maybe haven't performed as well the whole season and they want them to have a win. So then they, they put him up at the plate. That was me. Put them up at the plate. See if he can hit the ball and all this kind of stuff. And. <laughs> It Lean into it, Douglas. So Lean into it. It's fucking humiliating, man. It's like the basketball game. I don't want to be throwing the ball. Like, I don't want to just wait under the basket and have them throw the ball at, at, at me <laughs> and then to oh, miss when you have everybody's eyes on you. So don't do that to your kids, people. Don't do that. <laughs> Hang tight. We'll be right back. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap. The digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. Great news. Zapplication has extended their sponsorship of the Independent Artist Podcast into 2023. This is a podcast, Douglas, that you and I took on. It started out as a replacement for the NAIA's newsletter and quickly morphed into something else. It sure did. It's turned into a place where we can share our voices as professional working artists. You know, when we first took this project on, it was a pretty small potatoes kind of thing. And as it has grown, it has grown some serious expenses. So thank you to Zap for helping us take a lot of those on and get these voices heard. Our tribe is resilient and the stories are so fascinating. So stay tuned for another season of interesting and inspirational conversations on the podcast. Okay, so back to what we were talking about with uh, with looking forward to the year. I really am not going to put as much pressure on the shows that I am hoping that what I've learned in the last three years is that these other funnels of like installations or the the funnel of you know website that that can be nurtured more and maybe take the pressure off of having to hit the road every time I want to make a sale. Um, I don't know. Uh, do you have that kind of goal? Because I know you do work with galleries and you've taken on some installations and stuff like that. You know, the in person thing is still what drives me. Mm-hmm. I do have I have two galleries. One is is severely neglected. Right now Mm -hmm. that I, I, they actually opened up a new location and I haven't been able to fill any kind of orders for, for her. And then I've got this other one. I've got this, and she's funny. Like I have two main galleries that I sell really well in and I (laughs) feel like they know about each other and they're like, I have like the gallery owner's like, well, I could have sold that in my place. Oh, I saw that you're having a show. You could have done a show here. Why don't you just do the show here? (laughs) It sounds like, like so for I me, do, it sounds like my divorced parents. <laughs> yeah, there. It's a little bit like that. Yeah, <laughs> like why aren't you visiting here? Yeah, I saw you or your father's for Christmas. <laughs> so 
I don't know. I, I, I run myself a little thin. It's just me. Uh, I can only create as fast as I can create. Right. And I, I still love that in-person thing. You know, I mean, it boils down to this. It's like, yes, you have to, we have to diversify. We mm-hmm. have to, we don't want to, you know, yes, the website, yes, the galleries, yes, all this. I just, I hate it. I've told you before, I, like, I hate all this talk of that. Like, I just want to show up and sell my stuff. Like, and I'm excited about getting back into it and just getting there in person. Well, I think about, to me, what really hit home our first season with talking to Chris Dahlquist is how we can maximize our time at the shows. Because if we don't know what we're looking for, like, I know that I want to do corporate installations, home installations, and I have that going in my mind all the time. So when I'm at the shows and and in person, that I know how to funnel them into a sale at some point. You know what I'm saying? And I feel yeah. like the in-person shows are a huge part of, of how we do things. But knowing the goals of what I want to to have come out of it, it isn't just a wrap up and send what's in my booth that, that weekend. Yeah. I guess I, what I'm saying, like, if you're lucky enough in this business to to sell – as quickly as you're making it. I, that's not everybody. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily me. But if like you're if you're selling it at like at the end of the day, at the end of the year, you really don't have that much work left, then then you don't have that much en- energy to put in other areas. I mean, you're basically working as fast as you can and and getting yeah, what you need out of it. That's that's really what it boils down to. Like I'm trying to work smarter and not harder. That's the big adage, but at the same time, I'm working as hard as I can, and and it's it's paying off for the most part. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. Hey, back to that uh, topic we had earlier about deal making and the economy and everything. I was mm. curious about the whole process of like deal making. You know, so, okay. some artists really hate it. They say, "I'm going to market what it's worth." Somebody comes in and wants to wants to buy it at a discount. Go fuck yourself. I'm not oh, dealing. My. Right? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Well, how do you feel about it? You want honesty? You of want course, the, honesty. The, the full on honesty. I Here's want the full answer. on Bert. Bring it. All right. Here's my answer. If you don't make deals, then you're cutting out an entire percentage of the of the population that makes their money by making deals because right. they're not buying anything unless they get a deal. Like they deal with it all day long. You get mm-hmm. these top one percenters yeah. that people are doing it to them, and so they're going to turn around and they're going to do it to us. Is it fair that the CFO of FedEx got? $500 knocked off of this painting that, no, it's not fair, but get over yourself. And you factor that in, right? I mean, since you know yeah. that's that's the name of the game, that that's part of the whole, I mean, that's how I do it anyway. It's part of the dance. It's part of the dance. It is. It's part of the dance. If somebody walks into the booth and they're like, I love dancing. And you're like, yeah, well, I don't like the Foxtrot. F off. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. It's, it's just, that's the way I run mine. And I absolutely listen to like this. Here I have some dear friends that are going to be really angry about this and some former guests that are going to be like, what are, because here's, here's another side of that. Yeah. If, if I'm in my booth swinging deals, then I'm encouraging that same client to go in next door and swing deals with somebody who doesn't swing deals. And it it really for you. Why doesn't it work for this person down the street? It really screws up their business model. So it's a delicate balance. I'm not, I don't swing that many deals, but after having so many customers come into my booth that I recognize a certain type of human being and I still want their money, then I'm going to dance. Well, I have a couple conditions on my dealings. First, I do not want to devalue the the work. So I kind of know what's out there and I know what my work would fit into a s- similar category. I'm not going to like sell it for way less. You know, I'm not going to take the yeah. desperate oh fine. And I also was told early on in this business that if you make a deal with somebody you need to know that if they are going to be a repeat customer, that you've now set up that same relationship for every single transaction down the line. Right. So if your business is set up where you have somebody who buys from you every single year, you kind of have to have a way to negotiate that. Like maybe after they've bought three or four times, they become like a VIP client or something. You know what I mean? And, and that yeah. happens. Yeah. If you can keep track of that stuff like that. I mean, here's how I deal with it. Do you ever deal with your prices? And I've already sized them up. 
and I know that they're, you know, they're not going to be. Well, I think of it like a poker game. I think is that where you're well, kind of going, like yes. reading okay. their eyes and their body language, and say and think to yourself: if I say no, are they walking or are they dealing? You know. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of times, like I had this one client. This has been years and years ago. Oh, my wife hates this story. But um, <laughs> okay, Susan, uh, in, Susan, cover it, your ears. It's here. Oh, uh, she hates it. So it's <laughs> she's like, are you, she's she's sitting here thinking, like, please don't tell the pooping the pants story. Um, here comes. All right, so here it goes. I had these clients come in, husband and wife. She picked out six pieces, right? Okay, okay. like they wanted to do their whole house remodel in the work right so they're like i want this in the living room i want this in the foyer i want this over here in the kitchen i want this in the bathroom and i want this and she's like now it's up to you to make the deal okay. to her husband <laughs> and then she left okay. for him to go make the deal and it's like this is a different body of work than i currently have so the the like the six pieces it, it was a it was a half it, it's a show making so sure. you know it's like seven or eight grand yeah and and she's like and and i totaled him up and he was like he just <laughs> you let it out um, oh he's just his bowels released just just let down i was like wow i just i think i might have just made this guy shit himself okay <laughs> but uh, we worked out. I did not. And and again, it's like she's not going to be happy unless he closes the deal. Yeah. And it's like, well, I want him to be happy with the sale, too. So do you charge him like knowing full well that this is going to be a, a, a marriage <laughs> harming <laughs> failure if he doesn't come home with the, the big sale? So you have a you little leverage in the deal. You thinking. give him a little bit of it's like a little bit of like, look, here's. I'm going to give you my collector's discount. This is the price. This is what it is here. He still was like, you know, less air inside of his lower intestine. But at the same time, <laughs> it all um, worked out. Yeah, for sure. I think of talking to Terry Cowsey, once painter. She said, when somebody says, asks if I'll take a discount, I see a sale coming. And so I always think of it that way. They're 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 ready to deal. They wanna they wanna buy. Right. It. They're interested it's, in what you're. It's working. your job to close it. It's it's Either your closer. job. To... Okay, so that here's is... something that I thought was kind of uh, Michael Schregman. Cover your ears. Uh, Will we all know about the whole uh, horoscopes uh, deal out there? Do oh, you God. ever, with the new year, <laughs> start uh, looking at your horoscope and kind of planning out what the stars have to say about what what's uh. coming in your future? <laughs> No. <laughs> Play the variances. <laughs> no, I've not. Tell me what yours says. Oh Read me, my God. Tell me your horoscope. It's insane. Well, we have this book that we've kind of- If, it says, oh. if your horoscope says put a new foot forward, oh. then I'll believe it. <laughs> okay. All right? Okay. <laughs> but it's this really cool book that we- typically over the years would uh, on New Year's Eve. That's our tradition. We sit down and read. It's kind of a combination of numerology, astrology, tarot, and it's got it's based on the playing deck. And it's fun. Mm. I mean, we do this every year. It's our tradition. And yeah, I can tell from your reaction that this is kind of crazy. Well, I'm not. I, I kind of shut the door on it. I, I, let me hear a little bit more. I, I've, I love dearly some people who are into that kind of stuff. And just because I'm not doesn't mean I don't want to hear it. Well, there are plenty of us out there who are a little bit on the hippy dippy side and, you know, sure. um, who even witches. There's who, witches out there. There's be witches. witches among us. <laughs> And, and but I mean, that's what we do. That's one of our rituals every year is to kind of like you plan something and you just kind of like you enjoy it for what it's worth. It's kind of like a little a moment and then you let it go and you just kind of see what happens. But it, that's that's what we do anyway. What do you cool. do? For so any... you guys judge that stuff when you're you're looking at your schedule and things like that? Have you ever actually oh, made no, a decision? No, 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 no. We don't take it that that seriously. But, you know, it maybe kind of falls a little bit in, in line with what we talked about with Kat Tesla several episodes ago, like creating a vision board. You know, we read this stuff. We think about our future. We set an intention or a course for our life. And then we yeah. just kind of let it go and see what happens. But it like maps through your life. It maps through your year, through different periods and stuff like that. So it's like it's called the cards of your destiny for anyone who's into that kind of stuff. If you like to read and do predictions and all that kind of stuff. All right. All right. That sounds that's pretty cool. Um, hey, when you get ready for it, you said you've got more shows coming up when you are planning ahead for the year. Do you set yeah. like a specific kind of a production timeline calendar for like pieces or are you real loose about it? 
Um, yeah, how I look at it is I want um, when I'm going into a show season, I, I like to have what I call it hangings. Sure. Like I, I have my perfect booth. I lay out my perfect booth and that's my goal for one. Then I look at how many hangings I have. Okay. Like how many full hangings. If I sell out everything that I have hanging, I want to replace it. So I'm like, I want to go into a full spring with three full hangings in my booth. So I get the mechanical of it. And I mean, you work differently than than we do being 2D and telling stories. Is it based on size or is it based on stories? Do those get intermixed? You know what I'm mm. saying? Yeah, that's that's interesting. There are three. Mm -hmm. I want to have with me. I, I have a, a what what my goal is for the booth mm -hmm. uh, monetarily. I want to have three times the inventory as of my goal. Okay. Uh, for example, I had two shows in a row. My wife and I are going out on the road. We have the same two shows. Okay. Right? Back to First back show, show. Yeah. Yeah. Back mm -hmm. to back. First show, I blow it out. I mm -hmm. just absolutely crush. Mm -hmm. And th my booth is decimated, right? Mm. There's not much. It's totally picked over looking. Um, I really only have three paintings. I I typically wouldn't hang those together. It just it doesn't look like my booth. Sure. So typically, what would you do? You'd cancel, right? Yeah. Well, I'm already wrapped up with my wife. We're already going out. Uh, we're You're already a plus going one. west. Yeah. Yeah. So she didn't blow it out and, and decimate her booth. So I'm I'm backing her play, and I take, you know, I'm just going out. I set my booth up, and um, how did this was what was really cool because my goal has always been have three times as much as you expect to sell. I had three paintings and I sold one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I crushed it, right? Your I, math, I did your terrible. math did it. Yeah. But. My, yeah. I, but my, if you sell 33% of what you brought, God damn, you're crushing it. There so are, I crushed it, even though I only, you know, I walked with like, eh, you know, three or $4,000. I, that's interesting. That brings up a point I hadn't thought about. There's plenty of artists out there who work as couples who have separate bodies of work and do the same shows. And kind of that balance of like, well, technically, if you would have been on your own, you would have canceled, gone home and got to work. But because, right. you know, you're, you're, you guys are traveling together and stuff, I guess I, I sometimes don't think about how it, how that works for other people. Cause we work as a partnership. It all gets lumped into one big pile, right. you know, and I'm just not used to that whole thing. Yeah. Idea. I mean, I, there are plenty of shows where, where Dylan Straczynski backs Helen Gottlieb's play. You know, mm. where he's like, eh, it's an okay show, but Helen crushes it here. So we're that's here. where they go. And I might as well have a booth up. Mm hmm. You know, absolutely. That's interesting. So it, it is interesting. And that's a totally different business model. You're just kind of, you're, you're plus wanting it. I'm like, look, mm -hmm. um, I did a show last year where I, I, <laughs> I did, it was a complete gamble and I <laughs> took one on the chin. And I just walked around the corner and, and sold jewels with my wife. Instead. <laughs> that's where, I'm like, you that's know. where you were more needed was to, to sell her work. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Well, it made me think about the conversation that I had with Duke a couple of episodes ago when he said how him and Ledez to the to the dime would break down what, you know, and as a married couple, even they kept things very financially separate so that they both had their own independence. Mm. And that's not how we do it. But I thought that was so interesting. I hadn't even considered it that way. And they're even working in the same body of work. So, right. um, yeah, that is that is wild. Those huh. partnerships out there, how they how they work, it's really well, really cool. That brings back something you said earlier in the show too, where you're talking about your your show schedule, and I'm like, well, my ideal number of shows is six to eight. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, and you're like, I don't know, we're more twelve to fourteen. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, if you count how many Susie's doing. And I'm doing that's, well, that's a lot doing. higher. That's closer to 14, 15, which is up to what you guys are doing. It's mm -hmm. like we're, we're actually doing the same amount of shows, but you got to support both of you mm -hmm. in order to do it. And if you have two of you, then you can. That's you all, know, yeah. Assuming you so you can assuming you can walk around on your feet. That, <laughs> that's the big variable, isn't it? Yeah. So, why don't you hire somebody? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, that's such a great idea. I should consider oh. doing that. Hey, Will, will you come work for me? <laughs> Absolutely not. You can't afford me, baby. <laughs> hey, uh, so back to the, the new year and, and kind of like I'm in my head, obviously. Sure. Because of not being able to be physical. So I'm watching things getting 
inspired by things, making me wonder where that inspiration comes from. And I had a dream one night about my art and about the art business. And I realized we've never talked much about kind of the dream life on the podcast. Do you, Mm. does that ever factor into anything for you? Or are you one of those who just doesn't dream at night? Oddly, uh, you popped up in my dreams the other day, gorgeous. Uh, Really? (laughs) Yeah. Tell me all about it. Well, I was, I was, it was a a typical show dream kind of, and I, but it was just Uh like a regular show. And then you came bounding into my booth on your brand new feet. So uh, hopefully that, that, that means good things to come for you. Well, my energy is definitely there, but not physically. So hopefully that is a sign. I'll take it as a sign from the yeah, universe. Yeah, for sure. I wonder if there's something you can do. But back to the dreams. Do you ever uh, do mm. you ever have dreams about your, your art or dreams about being at a show? Anxiety dreams, sure. I definitely Typically, have anxiety dreams oh, yeah. at shows. Like like the show was set up like yesterday and then it's the yep. morning of and I'm supposed to, I'm not set up yet. It started, the streets are closed, you can't get to your booth, uh your booth is three feet wide. Um, yeah, I yeah. actually had one of those, uh, real life anxiety dreams once, uh, I set up, it was one of those morning setups, a Florida morning setup, and I set up my booth where it was marked and then they had mismarked the, the booth sizes. So an mm. artist came and their booth was like eight feet or something, uh, instead of 10. And instead of dealing with the director and having them find a new spot, they set their booth up in front of me and try as I might, I couldn't convince them not to. So they their booth overlapped two feet in front of my booth Seriously. and I was like their back room. So that that was like a real life anxiety dream. <laughs> what ended up happening? Did you just did you just take it or I took it and I had a shitty show. I, I I glare at them every time I walk by them and down the street. <laughs> See, here's how I deal with that. I'd be like, okay, your booth is coming down. All right. Yeah there's two options. You take your booth down. The other option is we end up on the news. <laughs> that's that's yeah, it. Yeah, you've that's... got a little more aggressiveness than I do in that regard. <laughs> Somebody's setting their shit up in front of my booth. You, Yeah, I do. I took it up yeah. with the director and they just shrugged and walked away. I'm like, oh, yeah, not good. Not good at all. That, so that, no, that, one of those. That's not happening. Pissy moments. But no, I, I do dream a lot. I do dream often. Uh, one of my anxiety dreams, actually, when the kids were little, this is bizarre. I'm blowing glass, and you know it's dangerous in a glass studio. Sure. And the dream will go from opening up the oven, and part of it might just be because so much of what we do is so repetitive, is so um, like second nature. So I'm opening up the furnace, which is 2,100 degrees. I take the glass blowing pipe, and I'm going to dip into the molten glass. And as I go to turn it, I realize... I'm holding my brand new baby and I'm like lifting the baby into the furnace and I wake up screaming and those <laughs> dreams are like real, man. Those are scary dreams. Yeah, that's not that's not good. Not good at all. Keep Thanks the baby I, out of the furnace. Oh, Jesus. But anyway, I, I do dream about, you know, work too. I've been dreaming a lot about making stuff and, and what we're going to make. And I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to this next year coming up. Nice. Ever come up with ideas in your dreams that you write down? Renee does. In fact, okay. Renee is very visual when she exercises. Huh. So there's a lot of times she will hop off the treadmill or take a break from what she's doing and she'll sketch something out so she doesn't forget it. Interesting. Um, her, her mind, yeah, gets really activated from from that. It's interesting where we're talking about inspiration and where ideas come from and just talking about going to the walker. And, and I tend to be... Uh, more influenced maybe by photography, which is odd, mm. um, than I am uh, about necessarily paintings. But oh, I so just, a different some... medium than yours gives you kind of uh, inspiration and for what to make about... for designs or or inspiration maybe. to do your own thing. You know what I mean? Like Doing my own juices, thing. I'm certainly not flowing. taking from somebody else. It's more of like honestly, the the big inspiration for me this year has been seeing like negative space again Mm -hmm. there's like the like i don't know if you know the the minnesota actually i believe she she lives down here in santa fe but agnes martin Mm. but like she's an abstract painter that my wife turned me on to that that we really love but there's i mean it couldn't have anything less to do with me and my body of work than you know this this really subtle 
abstract painting that you can barely even tell has a pattern until you're right up on top of it. Like and, no one would draw you know, the correlation that that would – like looking at your work and looking at this person's work that you would – find such inspiration from it. Right. Or like our um like Laura Nugent, who I really admire her work. She's an abstract painter, but it she's drawing from uh, some patterns and and getting down into some some patterns and things and and that is a really tough sell at an art show, like mm -hmm. this subtlety that she brings to her work because it's like you almost need that breathing room, that that walker space, you know, mm. that that museum space. She's more of like a an Agnes Martin kind of kind of thing in 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 the scale of a ten foot by ten foot booth. Or Sharon Lockhart again, these artists who are who are like they have the courage to let their work breathe a little bit, even within the composition. Mm. So I don't know. That's that's it. my goal. If if anything, this I've been year. getting inspired by stuff that wouldn't even relate to what we do lately too like i just watched the vivian uh westwood documentary she just passed away last week mm. um do you know who she is she's the I do. the punk rock uh fashion designer yeah i mean i just loved her story and i loved everything about who she is and she's not she was not classically trained and she was breaking boundaries and in many regards people disregarded her as even like a legitimate fashion designer but she had this amazing career that was a movement and so her her presence and her abilities were just so inspiring to me and to kind yeah. of like cut out the chatter and cut out the noise of what people think you know and just do your thing and to do your own special magic that right kind of comes back to the thing we refer back to it's like we all have that special thing we do and to not let you know, not let the negativity or or the external forces affect kind of putting your your best foot forward. Right. That's interesting too. The whole, I don't know. And, and how do you? This is another thing too. Like if you're only getting a, a and this goes back to again, and, and sorry to keep bringing it back up, but mm -hmm. like that two and a half paces in order to get past your booth. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you have something subtle? How do you have the courage to have subtlety within your work if you're constantly like hey look at me i gotta be bright i gotta be this i gotta be that i gotta be yeah you know I graphic think, or dramatic or i think know, how I, do you i'm trying to do that also with social media and with um website by showing what we do in people's homes as kind of like maybe an after the show kind of example or right. catalog of of what can be done because i do not want to show up to the to the um the show and and feel like I have a minimalist booth. I would be a nutso because I I do feel like I need to have I need to have everything we do represented because I want to have those conversations. Sure. No, that makes sense with what you're doing. It totally does because I, I what you and Renee have created is a store. Mm -hmm. And I admire that. Mm -hmm. And it's a different business model than what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create and it, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not, this is not, you know, one is not better than the other. But no, you, it's just you've different. You've created like yeah. a store where I have to create a gallery mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's like you kind of walk in and it's a little breezier, whereas you are going after more of like punchy excitement and you capture it's an energy, that, where, an energy, mm -hmm. but an elegance mm -hmm. within that too, which I think you nail. But uh, anyway, that's, but a lot that's, of what we do is with collections so it's piecing – one of the ways we are able to kind of up our game is having multiple pieces tell a bigger story. So a lot of times what that involves is swapping factors around in order to get that collection that somebody wants. And so right. we have to give that impression from how we display it. So that's another element of, of why we do what we do. Yeah, yeah. So speaking speaking of inspiration, you said you, you you know you got inspired from some stuff you saw at the Walker. I did want to ask you about where do you find your sources for like your stories? Is it from books you read? Is it from you know what I'm saying? You have specific yeah. stories that are your voice, and I'm curious, not necessarily to tell your secrets, but where do you usually find those those sources for stories? I, I don't know, Douglas. You're asking me to give my spiel. It sounds like you just walked into spiel. my booth I, and you're. I do feel right. like we have over the past two years 
we turn the spotlight on other artists and they tell kind of their process and sure we tell the business type stuff but the the kind of the how we do what we do i am interested in there are a couple of questions that over the past few weeks of me just sitting on my butt i've been thinking about that <laughs> with you what is your right. spiel what is your source uh my source honestly it it has everything to do with music if i wasn't an artist i wish i'd been a professional musician mm. that is what i i what really gets me in lyrics lately within the last like 5 to 10 years lately for 10 years but uh <laughs> That's lately you know you're within 50. the last <laughs> right la- lately within the last few years uh uh-huh. it's been Taking a fragment of a song lyric and taking it out of context, telling a different story with it. There's a show that I'm doing in a gallery show right now, which is kind of taking those legends of different eras. And I had done, I didn't, I wanted to stay away from musicians because I had done so many pieces about music so when i i got down to doing that kind of portraiture work Mm -hmm. it had more to do with my move out west and doing like legendary western portraits Mm -hmm. on old maps of native territories and telling the stories of of history versus truth and legend Mm -hmm. and so this story that i'm kind of telling at this you know in the chicago gallery i had talked to the gallery owner who's a who's a dear friend now uh chris jackson Mm -hmm. He and his his wife are on the circuit, uh, Jackson Young cool. Gallery, but Laura Young is the artist, and he's always been the seller, and they opened up a gallery. Anyway, talking to him about Chicago legends and you know who are the next steps of within that, like Western legends and Chicago, you've got the mobsters. So okay. I did this series of kind of like taking some of their quotes out of context, misaligning their quotes, taking them to mean other things for us as inspiration i guess mm. and then playing with uh the historical timeline as well like taking the background imagery is slightly different the um using some of my old kind of the lady in red as the focal point of like well the lady in red who is who killed dillinger you know mm-hmm. she's the one that set up john dillinger and mm-hmm. he followed this lady and and it's like if you take the actual story from eyewitnesses and the lady that comes in she's actually wearing orange okay but then that goes in hand in hand with like you know mark twain's never let the truth get in the way of a good story yeah i mean i do a lot of your your pieces i like that that uh twist or that deeper meaning or like the maybe an irony of of it is the line but then there's like the flip behind the meaning of that or what does it really mean what's the deeper meaning behind it right and yeah it makes me sometimes it makes me laugh it makes me think um, that's sweet yeah. I, the the you know a lot of times the meaning i i don't even share with with some of the people like, but there is so much behind it that is almost like it can be just for you it can it can be for the collector but you don't want it to prohibit the collector from I, let's say connecting with another element of it that maybe wouldn't jive with what your intention behind it is. I try to tell stories on a couple of different levels. I don't shy away from the term illustrator. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's what I was trained as. That's what I like. Mm -hmm. So when I look at my work, I think of it as large format illustrations presented as fine art, Mm -hmm. if you will, you know? And, and so I love to get into some more of the kind of abstract stuff, but I'm a lot more anal retentive than that. And I can't, I can't let that go. So I like to try to be a little looser and and uh, that's always my goal, but it's been my goal ever since I was in college. That's always been the critique of my work has oh, okay. been people have been like, can you loosen it up a little bit? Can you, you, let's see you get a little bit more free. And I'm like, you know, the older I get, the more I realize it's just not who I am. Yeah. Well, you got to do, you got to do what motivates you. I mean, really. Yeah. And dance with the one that brought you. Yeah, a lot of times line. I go to shows with new work and uh, they'll be like, yeah, but where's this? And I'm like, okay, well, I got to have a delicate balance of of being inspired still by my old work and taking it to new places. Sure. Um, uh, conversely, like, how about yourself? Like, where does where does that? How do you answer that same question? Are, for me and Renee, which there might even be differences between the two of us, but I, oh, I'm I, sure. I think that a lot of it is our is our process. I mean, we found each other's perfect playmate, and glass blowing is so much ebb and flow 
and changing along the way. And I fell in love with the process when we started, and I, I'm still in love with it. I love that you can start out in one direction, and then something starts to change, and you're like, okay, I have to abandon this original idea because the glass isn't going to do that, but I know where I can take it from here. So it's not like it gets out of your control or anything. Right. And so it almost, to me, serves as a symbol towards life, being a little more... um hippy dippy in the sense that do we really have control over every little aspect of things and to kind of allow that control to go and see how it manifests and you know buddhists believe that there's a real power in detaching from outcomes and so i would mm -hmm. say that we definitely work in that way especially in our kind of loose abstract what we call our watercolor series because yeah. it's challenging when the glass is stretching at varying rates. It's hard to have it be a predetermined look. So right. we flow with it and we allow it to have almost its own evolution. And that's almost becomes satisfactory in, in the aspect of the process because we know we, we solved that problem, that puzzle. We started here right. and we got to there. So it sounds like your medium dictates a lot of your creativity too because like you talk about the flow you got it and it's like that's the way your work has to flow between the two of you guys as well as the glass is that what you're kind of what you're saying i am new ideas and new series come out of where the glass went in a in a place we weren't expecting it and i sometimes feel like it becomes stale for us when we get too rigid about creating a design in our in our mind I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm not saying we don't sure. create a design. That would be like not even actually No, no, factual. I, I understand. But we kind of have a roadmap and we allow it to unfold. And pieces that I like the most are when they have a surprise at the end. And I'm like, oh, man, I did not see that coming. Yeah. Or with me, a lot like what, what, what Ben was talking about last week or a couple, few weeks back was the whole – sometimes our, our clients tell us what it's about because if I'm mm -hmm. taking – I try to tell open-ended stories with my work. I'll have a, a historical timeline that I'll walk, like where music comes from and where it goes and the deep south as it goes up the Mississippi River or 61 into Chicago. I'll, I'll work that theme. And, and that's where I like to sell my work, too, is a lot of times like – Along that corridor from New Orleans to Chicago, okay. that's where I, I feel alive and that's where, you know, the music that I love was created and I'll take a fragment of a song lyric and take it out of context and still tell that same story within the same story or have like, you know, myself at the crossroads of 61 and 49 instead of Robert Johnson. It's like, well, here's this, this you know, kind of cowboy guy and it's still the music of where it comes from and where it goes, but mm -hmm. taking different characters and putting them in different situations and that's what translates into other people's meaning right like if they if work. they have a similar when you have a connection to route 61 for example and then it might be different than what you were intending but their reaction to it is right. equally valid as to where what you were trying to express exactly i love the romance of that road because you've got take bob dylan mm -hmm. And he's up in Minnesota, and he's he's romanticizing sixty one, mm -hmm. getting down to the delta and and getting you know down into the mud of whatever. Well, then you take the, the blues artists who are down in the delta; they're dying to get on sixty one and get the hell out of there because it's this depressed, awful, racist, uh, restrictive place to live. Mm -hmm. So I love that kind of dichotomy of like. The romance of the road versus the the necessity and and the storytelling of what exists um, on on that 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 plane. So this just came to me. So music is an inspiration for you as a listener. Yeah. But were you a musician? Uh, yeah, I played upright bass in a, a little rockabilly blues band. Oh, cool! I knew you were and, in a band, but I did. Did you sing? Did you play? play? Uh, I just played upright. Played, sang a little backup. Um, you can find us on uh, iTunes cool. if you're interested in that. The band name. So Elvis had this henchman uh, as part of his Memphis Mafia whose only job was to go get Elvis and the rest of the crew hamburgers when they were up late um, practicing and, <laughs> and hanging out and partying. Okay. And so the guy's name was Hamburger James. 
And so we named our band Hamburger James. And and you can find we have two records up up on iTunes. Nice. There I am standing there looking super smug. But yeah, I play upright bass. And and um, what about not, that character you know, was so that made you want to choose that as as your group's name? Uh, that's just it, it's attached to that kind of uh the history of that music. Okay. And he's just. So ridiculous. Cool. Like he's a really ridiculous character. Hamburger James Collie. But last time I checked, he was still alive and, and living in Memphis. So you could just look him up. Awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Old, old guy. Hey, so one last thing before we, we go, I wanted to talk a little bit about this project and what we've been doing here on the podcast. I, we all know that Barbara Walters passed away recently and something that they played over and over again is clips of her talking about when she did her interviews with people how she would always finish the interview and be like, why didn't you ask that question? Or why didn't you ask that question? And it made me think about our podcast. Did you ever have okay. that when you have, when you talk to other guests that afterwards, like it went down a different road or you wished you would have asked that or something like that? Yeah, there's always things we leave on the table and, and little parts of the notes. And, and I try to end it, uh, typically I'll try to end it with like, is there anything we didn't cover just to see if there's things that that are out there? What do you, what do you wish we had, we had asked? Sure. But um. What are some of the ones that haunt you? Before I say that, I wanted to say that reminded me when you asked that of of Mark Winter, and we yeah. got that beautiful elephant story that he oh yeah that that he came about making the elephant shoes, and it's like we would have lost that had that moment not happened. That was a True. great yeah. story. Yeah, I love that story. Well, I do sometimes when I listen to him back and I'm editing, so it's kind of I have a little bit of a different experience. I think perhaps than you do. Maybe you do when you hear that interview kind of edited and stuff. But as I'm working on it and I'm listening, I think to myself, somebody just said X or Y or whatever. Why didn't I ask a follow-up on that? Why did I let that right. go and take it in a different direction? And there was a, a conversation that we I was having with Lisa Christine, and she talked about how the subjects of her work they were covered in mud and she saw this these this population of people in like the national geographics and she looked at them and she saw them as kind of unshakable right and that she said she did not feel that her life was unshakable and i wished i would have asked her to expand upon that but the moment was gone and we moved on to much other exciting topics and <laughs> but uh, that was one of the well, moments that i is... kicked myself no i i'm with you you know sometimes i mean there's got to be times too when i'm interviewing people too and you you're like oh my god why didn't you do this why didn't you ask them this i don't um, uh, what i actually remember more are the moments where i think of what i would have asked and you ask something like 180 than what i would have done and i'm like Oh my yeah. God, I love that he asked that. I love where <laughs> this went. And I get like a sense of surprise and like talking to Ray Alphonse, you know, his escape from Cuba. It was like this yeah. exciting story. You know? That was a, that one, that was, that was an instance where it was, it was pretty clear early on that it, it, I just needed to get out of the way that Ray had some stories to tell and just to, <laughs> you know, I, it, he took very little guidance, you know, he just, it's like, I just love listening to him talk. So that was, that was one of my favorites, but, uh, it wasn't I as... do want to know, I want to know more about Kina Crow and her, uh, her porn costuming experiences. That's, that's where I would have... <laughs> Let's get a little more follow like, up on that. Tell me more about uh, yeah. Let's let's hear a little bit more on that about that, that French no, maid's costume. <laughs> yeah, I, I think she got yeah. Let's hear what she's got. Let's, let's titillate the audience. Wait for sweeps week on that one. That has been one of the things people have talked about when they come up to me and they're like, "Oh my god!" And thinking of Kina dancing on the table as a little girl for her, so her dad could buy drinks. I mean, we've had so many awesome <laughs> stories over the past yeah, uh, you know, two seasons. It's, and I'm Definitely. looking forward to the ones we've got coming up here. So, yeah, we're we're getting close here to to episode fifty, uh, which is pretty pretty unbelievable. It's insane. But... It's totally insane. We we thought we, we might do this for I don't know until we got back on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It it became a uh, COVID project and, and really kind of took a life of its own. We appreciate, um, I'd like to say a couple of little shout outs, uh, yeah. especially sponsorship from the NAIA, giving us a little bit of credibility early on. Yes. And then uh, especially Zap too, for giving us the opportunity to get these voices out and um, really appreciate them uh, financially backing us and giving us the freedom and to, to say what we want, say, say our truth. They give us a lot of room 
we we don't take that lightly. We we <laughs> we don't step in it too often. Uh, but you know, we, they really trust. They trust that what we're putting out there is kind of real voices, not the yeah. varnished voices. So we're not just saying all good things. We are saying what's hard and what's tough. Sure. And, and, and I, to be fair, I step in it all the time. You just edit it. I, I edit it really well. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hell no. Not that one. You're like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no lawsuits today, Armstrong. <laughs> Over the year, one of my favorite intros, uh, you said, leading into the the Betty Yeager episode, you said as your introduction, you said, okay, and fuck you, here's Betty. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that's uh that's a good one talk about one of my favorites she's 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 a great human so a uh, special shout out to all of our special guests and i i feel like we're kind of winding it down we here are. my friend i'm talking to uh this week for the next episode i'm gonna sit down with amy fullbot no i'm sorry her name is amy flynn but i always amy insert flynn. fullbot as her last name Will Philbot be uh, attending Phil, the, the talk as well? Philbot is going to um, is going to sit this one out. It's going to be just me okay. and Amy. We're gonna we're gonna chat about uh, her her uh, ridiculous little mind to coin uh, Kena Crow's title. <laughs> so we're going to get into All into right. her inspiration and and what makes her tick. She's been a long time coming. It's uh, she's a, been a big fan of the show and and, and uh, she's a, a good a friend, huge supporter, yeah, and a good and a friend. Good friend. Yeah. So I, I'm excited to hear your talk there. I, she's got a lot to say. So who do you have coming up here, Will? You know what? I've got uh, Trey Taylor and Helene coming down the the pike as oh, well. Cool. We're going to talk about spirituality and and Peru and all I sorts of it. things. We're going to dig right down into. Um, Giving back to the community in Selma, Alabama, all sorts of things uh, that, that this talk is going to go. So I'm excited to let everybody hear this one. That's awesome. Well, we've actually just started talking and we turned a whole episode into it. So maybe this year we'll do a few more of these where it's just you and me kind of mix it up. Who knows how our format will change? Uh, we'll just stay tuned, everyone. Keep it fresh. Let's Keep do this. Fresh. We'll saw. Yeah, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks, folks. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. All right. Happy New Year. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, find us on social media and engage in these conversations. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. Oh, and if you like the show, we'd love it if you would give us your five-star rating and offer up your most creative review on your podcast streaming service. See you next time.